couple of months ago, Quiv the Lazy Geek approached me with an interesting challenge. He suggested that we both photograph the Pleiades, a beautiful star cluster and reflection nebula in the constellation Taurus. The interesting part of the challenge is he would have as much time as he wanted, meaning shooting Pleiades over multiple nights while I only had one night to shoot the object. And you might be thinking, well, how is this fair? Well, there's yet another twist to this challenge, which is Quiv shot from his balcony in Tokyo, where, you, as you can imagine, there's lots of light pollution from the city, while I shot from a more isolated location, a park in Rhode Island, that was substantially darker. Using Bortle's famous scale for sky quality, Quiv's location is a Bortle 8, while my shooting location is a Bortle 4. And the reason this challenge is so interesting is Quiv is trying to see if by putting in many, many hours on a single deep sky object, he can beat the advantage I had of a darker sky. And it's especially tricky because the Pleiades is a broadband object, meaning you want to capture all the light in the visible spectrum. So that rules out using narrowband filters. But Quiv did have some other tricks up his sleeve. I found out that he had put together a special new imaging rig for this challenge, which uh, was a schmidt cassegrain telescope, but in a hyperstar configuration, meaning he'd be shooting at f2, while I'd be using my Ascar lens, which maxes out at a focal ratio of f Four and with a much smaller aperture. Now, I plan to use the Ascar with a QHY 168C camera I have, but you'll hear my conversation with Quiv why that didn't work out, and I ended up using a stock Canon T7. Before I roll uh, that Zoom chat that I had with Quiv, I want to let you know if you stick around to the end of this video, I'm going to wrap it up by talking about what causes walking noise and what you can do to avoid walking noise, and then how I approached diminishing its appearance in my photo because I didn't avoid it and the walking noise was honestly pretty bad in my Pleiades photo for this challenge. Okay, so with this challenge, Nico, first, thanks for, for doing this challenge with me. Um, I've had a lot of fun actually doing the, uh, the challenge and uh, it actually is the first time we talk just the two of us on Zoom, so it's, uh, it's very interesting as well. And uh, like just to, I already spoke to you about the strategy that I took. And what I did is that from my balcony here uh, in Tokyo, it's actually 500 meters away from Tokyo proper. Um, I used my C6 telescope with a hyperstar lens so that I was imaging at a focal ratio of F2, which means I can get very short sub exposures and I get more light per pixel per unit of time, basically. And I hoped that would give me an advantage compared to a darker area, which is uh, what you did. And I think I took around, yes, yeah, six nights. I took uh, three nights with an ASI, ASI 533 MC Pro, that's a one inch uh, sensor. And then I took three more nights with an IMX 571 sensor, a rising cam camera. It's kind of a knockoff uh, 2600 MC Pro. And um, I stacked everything together and I had around uh, 3,000 frames of 20 seconds and 30 seconds each, something like that, for a total of 22 hours of data. So 11 hours APS-C size and 11 hours one inch size, and then I stacked only the one inch per portion together. Uh, I heard that you had trouble on your side. Yes, uh, lots of trouble. So I was using the Ascar lens that you have as well yeah i i didn't i haven't run into any of the sort of issues that that you have with the threads or the yeah. uh the star issues so it was all user error on my on my side so what happened was i i wanted to uh dither and do automatic focusing and all this other stuff because usually when i hit the dark site I'm running three setups. So right. I want, I want, and, and one of them is usually untracked. So I, that one's you're you're very intensive. You're there having right. to recenter. And so I wanted this setup to be as automated as possible. I didn't want to right. have to check focus and all of that. So here's the setup. Let me see. Oh yes. I have exactly the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I have the, yeah, the ZWO EAF there. Yeah. And uh, the little ZWO mini guide cam on top. Yeah. And then this is all the other automation stuff, the power yeah. box and whatever. Um, and and then this this having this on front also helps balance, you know. Right. Uh, right. Otherwise, you need a, some kind of like 
counterweight out there. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so and I had I had tested this entire setup with uh, monocam at home. So that's a rule that I always have is I'm going to test the setup at home and make yeah. sure it works, then tweak if I need to. And that's my rule for going to a dark site, test yeah. it at home. But then I did something really stupid. I, I said, okay, I don't want to waste time on filter changes with a mono cam right. and refocusing by filter. So I'm going to switch to a color camera. Right. And I thought this is going to be easy. I have the right spacer on there for 55 millimeter back focus. I, I already know that. All I have to do is just screw it onto the back of my SCAR lens. So I did that. I get to my dark site. I can't reach focus. I, 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 I oh, no. go through the entire focal range. I start at one end to go all the way to the other. No focus. And I realized this at some point I had put this extra five millimeter spacer on there. I have uh -huh. no idea why I have no uh -huh. memory of doing that. And I couldn't get it off. And, no. so, <laughs> and, and, and this is a very common problem. If, if you are in astrophotography long enough, you'll find yeah. that spacers bind together. It happens on, on so it's, many of my spacers yeah. and you, you just, you, you try with rubber grip and you just, you admit that these two will not come apart. Yeah. So I have no spacers to get me to the right back focus with this camera. Um, but it took me about 45 minutes, an hour to realize that during the dark, because at this time of year in the Northeast, it gets dark at like four 30. I mean, I guess that's right. all over the world, but I mean, in the Northern hemisphere. And so it was already dark. I'm just wasting dark time. Now, luckily I did have extra cameras. I did have a plan B. So, uh, but I didn't have a USB cable to control this Canon T7 from the oh, computer. No. Right. So, so then, uh, I'm like, okay, I've wasted so much time. I'm not even going to guide. I'm not going to do any computer control other than just have the mount running. Right. And so I just started taking 30 second pictures with the, the T7 with an intervalometer. And that's what I ended up doing. No guiding, no dithering. I was just like, I need to get at least a few hours here. And if I try to set this all up now, I'm probably just going to waste time. Uh, so that's, that's my story for this challenge. Uh, broke my own rule in a way by changing cameras and then I paid for it. Yeah. Yeah. We've all made this kind of mistake. Uh, I remember changing a camera before going to a dark site and forgetting the T ring for that camera. I had the, the T ring for another brand. Oh yeah. And Yep. Uh, I, I duct taped it together in the end. <laughs> it kind that of worked? worked, but there was okay. a bit of tilt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, and like for, for any beginners watching this video, by the way, this um, spacers binding together, it happens all the freaking time. And uh, I like to have, I think I have two strap wrenches in my car at all times just for that, just yep. so I know I can unbind those things. Because sometimes even, as you said, rubber, rubber gloves are not enough. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a big problem. So do you, do you have like, uh, I've tried strap wrenches and uh, the, the problem I've had is sometimes with something like this, where it's only five millimeters, right. I can't get the strap wrench to just sit on that piece yeah. and not extend over onto this one somehow. Or do you have sort of like very thin ones that no, work I, well? No, I or? have thick ones. They're probably okay. like two centimeters or, or almost one inch or something like that thick. And uh, I, I did use them on such small adapters, but it's really hard and it takes yeah. a lot of time. And if you're in the dark, in the cold, sure. uh, yeah, forget about it. Yeah. Have you, have you found any other tricks work? I know some people say like try freezing or. Yeah, I, I tried freezing. I tried uh, micro, uh, not microwaving, but putting it in the oven. You know, and, uh, and that kind of stuff, it, it does not work. And no. <laughs> there, there was a long time when I didn't know that strap wrenches were a thing. So it's like I, I had bound adapters at home that I didn't know what to do with. Yeah. And I, I would use like huge, 
I had pliers on them and then huge marks. <laughs> huge scratches, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So, yeah, that's, uh, I was dumb. I didn't know. I, I had no mechanical bone in my body. I, I don't know how mechanics, mechanics work except like worm gear. So, it's, uh, I had no idea those tools existed. But, like, I'm super impressed because I think, like, every time I went to a dark site this year, something went wrong and I wasn't able to get anything out of it. Um, and I think that's like one of the big things if you live in the city and like me, you have setups that are permanently set up on my, on my rooftop for me. It's like, at least if something goes wrong, like you can do something about it, like in a fairly calm manner with all of the equipment, you need to do something about it on the spot. Whereas like when you're traveling to a dark site, that there is a bit of the Murphy lottery going on there, right? Definitely. Yeah. And what I've uh, learned is not only to have like backups of every cable, every possible thing. I mean, I have backups of mounts, cameras, every, right. everything. <laughs> but then uh, also like you have your plan A in your head and knowing when to just give up on plan A. So like, for yeah. this challenge it's like i probably spent too long on plan a but then as soon as you commit to plan b just go for it i mean just yeah. and then stop fiddling because i i found a lot of astrophotographers are fiddlers and you'll see them on the at the dark side at a star party even and they'll i'll ask them well how did last night go and they said oh i was just um messing with phd2 all night and i'm like yeah why why not Don't. Get the yeah yeah <laughs> I think like we like to, we don't like to leave a problem unsolved. Yep. And so we get tunnel vision on those things. I think a lot of us would make terrible pilots because we'd be tunnel visioning on a single instrument the whole time, forgetting that we're rolling and, and falling out of the sky. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I, I completely get, uh, get the idea. And uh, now on my rooftop, I actually have three different setups all ready to go and that way if I need to mess up with one, I, I, I had the other two to, uh, to back me up. Yes. <laughs> uh, but still, like, I think in the end, you got like three hours, something like that. Yeah, about three hours. Yeah, that is that is already a lot. And I feel like three hours would beat my 22 hours. But uh, but we can see. Can I see the results? Yes, I'll share my screen here. Let's see. Here. Awesome. All right, there we go. <laughs> okay, so that's that's three hours. No dithering, no guiding. Huh? Yeah, no, yeah, just at F four, and uh, so I did achieve the the thing that I set out to do in a way, which is I really I I looked at um the uh, what is it called the digital sky survey the the imagery, yeah. and that's how I always sort of plan my shots, whether it's on telescopius or yeah. blackwater skies or whatever. And I I noticed this really strong dust component here. Yeah. And I just thought, okay, this looks really cool how it sort of is like a, like an S into yeah. the Pleiades. And I was like, that'll be a great diagonal across the frame. And then I can even include, so originally I was thinking of doing this at um, 360 millimeter focal length. Uh -huh. But then when I saw that at 200, I could get the, this little vulture head uh, dark nebula down there in the corner. Yeah. I, thought, I, I need to try to get that because I haven't seen too many shots framed like this where where you have the vulture head to the Pleiades. Yeah, this composition is amazing. It's it's such an awesome shot. So like we often see Pleiades to uh, California nebula. Yep. Right. In terms of composition, but like just this, this is so cool. Plus, so much dust. And so I, I like how uh, the dust around the Pleiades, you get, um, it's not, some people process it so that this whole thing is just brown, but yeah. there's actually a lot it's of blue. bright blue yeah. stars that give a blue dust. And I, I yeah. think that's really cool. Completely agree. I, I saw the same. I have, even on my APS-C, because I'm at 300 millimeters, I have a tighter um, kind of um, uh, field of view, but still I see and I was surprised, and I was actually surprised to be able to get that from Tokyo as well, is to see that some of that dark nebula right next to the Pleiades is actually blue because of the blue star there that is 
shining it up. And I, I really, I really love that. It's, it's a beautiful target overall. Yeah. It's, it's, and it, it makes me think about what do we call a reflection nebula, which is just the stars, yeah. uh, you know, shining on the dust versus a dark nebula. Uh, That's true. They're effectively the same thing, right? Yeah. It's just about the, it's just about, I think we only call it reflection nebula if it's a nice color to us, yeah. you know, blue and yellow are nice and brown is sort of. Uh... <laughs> yeah, because I mean, dark nebulas, they are reflecting yeah. some light, otherwise yes. we wouldn't see it. Exactly. So they're reflection nebula, technically speaking. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very, uh, very good point. I think it's, and there might be a historical component to that, right? In terms of how the, the nebula were first classified. Well, and I think that some of the dark nebula, um, like the one in the Milky in Sagittarius and things yeah. like that, where uh, there's so many stars in the Milky Way, and then the way that most people process those ones, I don't know if you could process them to be bright, but most people process them to be almost like inky black. Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. Like, like Barnard's E, for instance, or something yes. like that. It's almost always processed to be just black against the Milky Way. Yeah. Um, but if when you're in these regions, the dusty constellations like Taurus or Orion or whatever, then people usually uh, or Cepheus, uh, then people bring bring out the dark nebula and try to make it stand out against yeah. the sky. Yeah. And like one of the things with dark nebula, though, is that in from Tokyo or from really bad border zones, they become my enemy because they're like there's enough signal that they start having like those like slightly little pixels all over the place, but not consistently. So they're a source of noise in a way uh, in the image that is really hard to get rid of. And uh, I was imaging the, the California nebula recently uh, on the Ascar lens, actually. So same kind of field of view. And I could see like one corner of my frame was dark. There were no stars left. And I'm like, I had to look at the sky, sky survey to see like, yeah, there's a, a, a dark nebula there that's just hiding stuff. And uh, that, I, I love to see this kind of stuff. And this composition is amazing. Like, there's so much dust. The dust color is beautiful. You have the vulture. And the Pleiades is like such a natural color. And that's just three hours of data. And it's all manual. Yeah. That's and I, I did, maybe I'll show this in, in my half of the video. I did have to do some uh, sort of hacky work in Photoshop to reduce the walking noise, you know, that those diagonal yeah. lines, yeah. because I wasn't dithering. And I had it on my Orion Atlas. So it was, it was very steady, the tracking. And so when you're, when your tracking is very steady, but you're not dithering, you get yeah. very noticeable walking noise, especially with a DSLR. And so, uh, but I, I noticed that the walking noise, the, the dominant noise color was a red. And so I basically just did a select the red, right. and desaturate it. And that helped a lot. That is such a cool way to do it. Yeah. And uh, I've been a victim of walking noise so many times when I was starting before I knew dithering was a thing or before I was auto guiding. And uh, yeah, like, that's a super good way of getting rid of the, uh, the walking noise. Yeah. And well it's, done. it's, it's, and I think, um, a lot of people's, uh, inclination is to reach for no normal noise reduction That's techniques horrible. It and it's works. terrible. It's, it's, it's going to totally destroy your image. It's going to make it all a yeah. blurry mess. Uh, yeah. if you do that. So this is really no noise reduction because it can't at three hours, it can't really handle much noise reduction. I'm yeah. sure yours at, at 22 hours can, but this at three hours, I don't do normal noise reduction. I just try to desaturate the noise. Uh, right. If, I, if, it, if it has a unique color component to it. Yeah. I have to say like on many of my pictures these days, I use Topaz Denoise to do some noise reduction. Uh, after removing the stars, denoise the nebulosity, put back the, the stars. Um, and I see a lot of people use Topaz Denoise as well. And actually, I have a video on the topic that will be coming out in a few days when we're talking. And probably by the time this video comes out, it's going to be out already um, about how Topaz Denoise can introduce detail that doesn't exist. 
And I mm -hmm. see that very often. Some of the most amazing pictures I've seen like on Facebook um, or on Astrobin that have been selected as picture of the day, whatever. I look at the details of the nebula. I compare it to the Hubble picture of the same nebula and there's details that are like that don't exist and you recognize the trace of topaz denoise and uh and denoising has gotten much better with topaz denoise these days but there are things that annoy me about some denoising techniques that are being used and there's no denoising technique that i know of that works really well on walking noise so i think your way of doing this saturation like really really nice and I love the end result. It's uh, I can already tell you it's better than mine. <laughs> oh no, I don't. I don't think so. Let's let's switch to yours here. Yeah, let me let Stop me sharing. share my screen. <laughs> okay, so I'll start with the eleven hours of APS-C beta. So this is how it looks like. Um, can you can you see the screen? Yep, I can. Looks great. It's. I mean, it, the the ad. So I mean. Of course, we're we're looking at different image scales here, yeah. but I I think that your stars actually I think that I, I've watched some of your videos about the hyperstar, and you said that the stars are probably going to be a weakness of that telescope. But yeah. I think your stars look great here. I love the the color. Thank you. That's yeah. Uh, yeah I, I think like a lot of people don't like the the star spikes that you get with with hyperstar because of the diffraction artifacts. And they place cables in, in different ways to avoid that. And I don't care that much. And by the way, while I'm zooming in, uh, if people are interested on APS-C, the, the stars in the corners, they're definitely uh, degraded. They're a bit elongated because I probably don't have the spacing perfectly right. But they're, uh, they're perfectly acceptable. And this is like barely cropped. Only the stacking art artifacts were, were cropped. So it's I, I'm I'm really impressed actually with Hyperstar uh, for now and yeah this is from Tokyo and as I was mentioning like some of the blue areas here on the on the bottom left is there in the dark nebula like there is a blue tinge and I, I really I love that color and already with just like 11 hours I was quite satisfied but when I zoom in you can see it starts kind of of breaking up because there's tons of noise that I, I haven't been able to really take care of. But when you look at it from afar, I'm, I'm actually super satisfied with this uh, because it's, it's from, from Tokyo. It's from a Bortle 8, Bortle 9 zone. And uh, I didn't expect it to be that good with just, well, just 11 hours across, across three nights. Still, I think you managed to get more dust <laughs> than I did. So it's like... It's, it well, yeah, I, actually, you know what we should do is crop uh, my image to the same yeah. field as yours to actually yeah. examine them. We can both do that in our videos just to, to, to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that'd be I, interesting. I, um, I'll, I'll send you, of course, the, uh, the, the processed image in, in, uh, in TIFF or EXIF format, and you'll do the same, and then we can, we can look at that. I think uh, but, that your your signal to noise ratio is definitely better than mine. You you were able to bring the the sky background brighter. If if we looked at mine again, you'd see it's a lot darker, and that right. was to hide noise, basically. Um, right, yeah. which a common technique. Yeah. And I I think in your case, it actually looks great. It's great for the composition. And I'm wondering whether even if you had had the freedom to brighten the background whether you would have taken that freedom because then the S might be less visible. And that's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, because I have seen images, actually, I do a challenge on my Patreon of, of yeah. the last month's challenge was uh, Taurus, anything in Taurus. So a lot of people picked this kind of scene. Yeah. And I, a lot of people were really bringing out the dust, but then, yeah, you're right. You lose the S if you just really bring it up because yeah. there's dust everywhere to bring exactly. out. Yeah. It's, it, it's a tough, tough call. And let's see. So now I'm going to show what I have with 22 hours of data. So this is after I stacked both the ASI 533 and the IMX 571 um, data. So it's a one inch kind of much tighter field of view. And the, the noise is much more controlled. I see more details. And I was actually surprised. 
I thought that with 11 hours at F2, I couldn't get better in terms of signal to noise ratio, uh, but I did. And this image, the, the full stack 22 hours was actually much easier to process than the 11 hours image. And that's something that I learned and, and through this challenge. I would never have learned otherwise because I don't think I would have ever spent those additional 11 hours at F2 because I, I, I didn't think it would add anything, but it actually did. And, and I'm really like, it's interesting to, it's the first time I do a challenge like that because normally I don't challenge myself enough and now that I did, I'm really happy with, with what I got here. And I, I, I don't think a lot of people would look at that and, and think that it was taken from Tokyo. Uh, definitely not. I mean, I, this is better than any image I've ever <laughs> gotten from. Because uh, I live in the city too. It's just that I don't often show that part of uh, right. my photography on YouTube. But it's, this is better uh, than anything I've ever done from the city. It's, it's, re it's really quite amazing. I, I wonder, I, I don't know if the zoom compression is, is mm -hmm. making me say this, but it looks almost like the 22 hour version also has much better contrast in the high signal areas. Yeah, is that true? I, it is, it is. Like I saw when I was processing, I'm sorry, there's the JPEG comp uh, compression that, uh, and then we'll, there will be YouTube compression and zoom compression. So it's not going to look very good, but there was so much detail in the areas here in the center, in the wispiness here, even in the high contrast areas. And I did not expect that. I don't know why. Or maybe like the, the latter data had better, better seeing. I don't know, but there, it was just easier to process overall. And I was able to get more, this, there was just more detail available. And, so the, uh, the 571 and the 533 have the same pixel size, right? Same pixel size. It's basically yeah. the same sensor, but cropped, right? It's right. like, if you looked at the, I'm pretty sure that Sony, when they build the sensor, they just like cut in different sizes and that's yep. it. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's basically the same thing. And that's why I, I was comfortable like mixing them together. Yeah, when I, when I got the 571, I was very surprised that it also has the same pixel size as the, the ASI 1600, the 3.76 micron or whatever. Right. It's very and close. I think it's 3.8 versus 3.76. I don't quite remember. I might yeah, but it's, it's so close that I, I, I was like, okay, this is going to work. I continued on with mosaic projects that I'd started with that. And it really does help when you're at this exact yeah. same pixel yeah. scale. Um, it's, uh, it's very true. Yeah. And uh, I like I think my backspacing was slightly different between both cameras. And the good thing with Rising Cam is that um, they copy ZW in that the backspacing to the sensor is 17.5 millimeters, just like other uh, ZW cameras, at least with the uh, the ring at the front. Um, yeah, let me stop sharing so uh, we can we can keep discussing. But it's like honestly. I, I expected your image to be amazing, but when I heard that you had had issues and you had only three hours of data, I was like, ha ha, maybe I'll get a better result. And then I, I still see that amazing amount of, um, of data in there and dust and the really good processing. And I'm like, it's you, you got a really an amazing result. Um, I, I would wonder, you know, it's like, uh, I mean, the, people have probably do, can do endless videos like this on YouTube where it's like, now I wonder what your, yours would have looked like if we had s swapped locations. Right. Of course, you know, it's like my three hours of the DSLR from Tokyo versus your 22 hours from my site. That would be, it'd be so interesting, a YouTube yeah. video, if we could like actually get on planes and, and switch oh, spots. Oh, that would be so cool. <laughs> yeah. I, well, one day, maybe one day we can meet at Neef or, yeah, uh, right. or whatever it's called and then try to do some, some astro together. That would be so cool. Okay, let's dig into my image a bit here at the end. And I want to focus on one thing, which is what we call walking noise. And walking noise is created by a combination of two things, fixed pattern noise and field drift throughout the night. So fixed pattern noise is just any noise 
that, as the name suggests, stays somewhat consistent from frame to frame. And most color cameras will have some. It's this ugly model in the background. You know, some of it's going to be random and change from frame to frame, but some of it stays somewhat consistent. And field drift, uh, I'll show you that. I'm just gonna blink through the frames quickly here, and you can see the stars are slowly moving down and to the right. And just to show that even a little bit more clearly, I stacked everything uh, over three hours, but didn't register the frames. And you can clearly see that we had a, some, some, stamp, some substantial field drift, um, like I said, down into the right, which matches up with uh, the declination. And there's a number of reasons you could have drift like this. Um, it's most likely that uh, polar alignment got a bit off. Maybe I bumped the mount or something. Uh, in any case, we can see that there was significant drift, and after I align all of the photos based on the star patterns, uh, we get the fixed pattern noise basically turns into streaks of noise following the direction of the drift, and that's what we call walking noise. Now, after I just stack and apply an auto stretch, it doesn't look too bad. I don't. I really don't really see any noise, and that's pretty normal. I find that you only really get to start seeing the walking noise after you really push the image uh, to bring out what you want to bring out. And so in this case, I wanted to bring out this S of this very faint dust with the vulture head down here. And so by really processing the image, um, you start seeing the walking noise. And I'll show you, even if I just remove the stars, I think you'll be able to see it a lot clearer. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So you see this diagonal noise going across like this. The key, if you want to break up these streaks of noise, there's sort of two good ways to go about that in the capturing of the data. One is trying to eliminate the source of drift because if, if, if you had no drift, then you at least wouldn't get the lines. You'd still have noise in the background, but you know, at least would just sort of stay in one place rather than turn into these very visible lines across the image, these streaks. And then two, um, if you use auto guiding with something like PHD2 and you dither between taking each exposure, and especially if you dither in both declination and right ascension, that can really help a lot because it's going to break up the noise patterns. So instead of just forming these consistent streaks, it will be slightly shifted between each frame. And then when you stack all of the frames together, the noise is no longer consistently along this pattern of the drift, and it gets a lot more broken up and a lot less visible in the final image. So dithering is very important. It also helps you eliminate some noise just through the stacking process because it's going to throw out outliers and if those noise patterns those fixed pattern noise patterns aren't in the same place they're all shifted about then it's going to be able to throw them out as outliers in the data um, but let's say you can't guide and dither or you didn't guide and dither uh, like i didn't um, then what can we do to try to diminish the appearance of this walking noise in the image? Well, uh, the first thing is, uh, I don't know how well it will come across here, but there's a lot of green uh, noise here. And so the first thing I often do with an image like this one is I run a process under noise reduction in PixInsight, if you have PixInsight, called SCNR, and I run it on the green channel, so under where it says color to remove green. Um, I don't want to run it at, at full strength. I usually run it at something like half strength uh, to start. And I find that that actually, um, I'll just show you before and after here. So here is before, lots of green noise. And here's after, and it didn't hurt the the you know the colors of the in the image too much. Uh, it didn't really disrupt the color balance. I don't think you really just removed a lot of the green noise. Now 
if you wanted to keep going with this and remove you know the red noise and the blue noise what you'd really want to do is start masking because if i just ran this without masking you're going to pretty quickly make your image monochromatic because if you keep removing uh too much of the color uh, using this scnr process it's not going to work very well um, but usually removing green is fine because unless you're dealing with comets or something like the trapezium in Orion, there's not too much green in space um, or something like a planetary nebula. Of course, you wouldn't want to do it. But between the Pleiades and the, and the dust, there's not too much green in there that we have to worry about. Okay. Um, so from here, you can still see the, the streaks, but I want to show you, I'm going to um, open this up in Photoshop. Okay, so here's the, the image open in Photoshop. And as soon as I add the stars back to the image, immediately we the stars help break up the image enough that the noise isn't as noticeable, but I do still see it here, in, especially in the dark areas of the image. So the next thing that I do is I basically just try to hide it by removing a lot of the magenta in the image. Because uh, what's left now, a lot of it is uh, magenta-ish noise. And so I just run a selective color layer here and I remove a lot of magenta from the magenta. <laughs> um, I do a little bit more with um, sort of crushing the blacks too. So in the neutrals, I just raise the black level and in the blacks, I again, raise the black level just slightly. And th so this helped a lot. What we're left with in terms of noise, the only real noise I see that's the, you know, the walking noise that I see that's left is a little bit of a sort of orangish red um, because we've removed the magenta from the reds. So what's left is maybe just a little bit of an orangish red in a few spots. So what I do there is I just click back to my starless layer here and I'm going to select by color range. And I just select those parts of the image where I still see a little bit of that uh, walking noise in the form of sort of a orangish red line. And you can play around with the fuzziness slider here, and then you can also um, sort of blur this, uh, this mask that you're creating until you basically get something like this, where you can see this, this is still following that direction of that drift. It's, so it's still the walking noise, but I'm only selecting some parts of the background here. Um, and so I just did that by selecting by color uh, and then sort of just working with the mask a little bit. And then all I do is I just desaturate those parts of the image. I just brought it down by negative 77, and I also brought down the lightness just a little bit. And so this is a much more subtle change, um, but if you know where to look, you can see I'm just really desaturating certain little parts of noise here that are left over. Um, one little tip that I found works well when you're doing this is if you're having trouble seeing what you're doing, you can throw on an adjustment layer that just raises the overall exposure a couple stops and then work through this process of trying to remove the walking noise. And then you can just turn that back off um, to get back to sort of a neutral place that you were in before. Uh, with this image, I, I got it to this nice neutral place where I diminished the appearance of the walking noise, and then I just did some final curves work to bring back up the dust a little bit. And then this is my final image. So hopefully that was helpful. Again, the, the, you know, this was a little bit Photoshop specific here at the end, but if you wanted to do something similar in PixInsight, you could just work with masks, uh, you know, if you could work with the color mask script, um, for instance, to try to select the certain colors and then desaturate them with curves or something like that. Um, so one thing that I, I did, I have found, and I, I did mention, I think in my conversation with Quiv is you can't really blur walking noise. That's just going to really give you a soupy mess. 
what you're really wanting to do is select its color and just and desaturate it but leaving the rest of the details it's sort of like trying to separate out different parts of the image and it's it's a little bit of a a, a guessing game sometimes but again the 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 processes that i found work very well for this kind of thing are sc and r in pix insight maybe with a mask and selective color uh, and select by color in photoshop okay well that does it for this uh edition and i hope everyone enjoyed this uh, challenge that i did with quiv i certainly did and was blown away by what he was able to pull out from tokyo Okay, since this video I'm sure is over 20 minutes long, you're now seeing all of my current members here on uh, my Patreon campaign. And if you want to see your name in the credits of future long Nebula Photos videos, you can sign up over on patreon.com slash Nebula Photos. And we now have over 500 members, so it's a big, cool community. And there are a bunch of benefits outside of just your name in the credits of long videos. Uh, some of those benefits include, I now, I did one exclusive video and I'm working on a second exclusive video just for Patreon. Uh, there are monthly Zoom chats where you can ask questions of me and other people on the chat. There is a Discord community, which is really cool, very vibrant, lots of stuff going on there, including monthly imaging challenges with prizes, a quarterly group imaging project where we're all working on the same deep sky object together. And Patreon also has lots of different communication methods. You can direct message me straight through patreon.com. You can also do it on Discord. And so there's a lot of cool ways to connect and really get involved. And so if you want to accelerate your learning further after watching some of my videos, consider joining over on Patreon. It starts at just $1 a month. And again, the link is patreon.com slash Nebula Photos. Until next time, this has been Nico Carver at Nebula Photos. Clear skies. <laughs>